This is the Ball and Beam Project, presented by Group 5. My name is Christopher Burton. My name is Charles Ernst. My name is Bradley Steiger. And I'm Kevin Surratt. The goal of this project was to design, build, model, control, and test a ball and beam system. Using our knowledge of modeling and control from this class, we were able to apply what we know into a real system by integrating hardware and software together into one design. To start off this project, we designed and built the beam. Then we set up the wiring and code using MATLAB and Arduino. Then we created a block diagram in Simulink. And finally, we finished it by testing that the beam follows certain constraints in testing, shown below. Now let's get into some of the hardware constraints for this project. The beam was required to be straight, smooth, and unrestricted so that the ball could roll freely across the track. The ball had to be able to travel 12 inches from the pivot center to the tip of the track without touching end stops, and no spring or dampening element was allowed to be used. Each team was given a soft potentiometer, servo, and a hard potentiometer for this project. Then we took our Arduino kits, and used Arduino code or any software in order to control the beam. Our end stops were made out of TPU to stop the ball from rolling off the edge. And we had beam markings that needed to be at least zero to 12 inches. And the starting point of zero inches had to be at the center of the pivot point. We decided to wire our ball and beam as shown. The reason the ports used in the Arduino are spaced out is to reduce the amount of interference between the hard potentiometer and the soft potentiometer readouts. The resistor was used to limit voltage to the soft potentiometer so that we could achieve a more accurate reading. For our ball and beam design, we wanted to have a four bar linkage and we wanted this linkage to be perpendicular to the servo because we wanted to have our servo move from negative 45 to 45 degrees. And we also made sure we had TPU stops at least one inch from the zero and 12 mark because we wanted to have a one inch room in case the ball had to move that way. The free body diagram, there are four forces that, exert, that are exerted on the beam, the gravitational force, the normal force, frictional force, and the force due to angular velocity. Given this, a governing equation for the sum of all the forces and tor torques were able to be made. Using the, the assumptions listed in the figure and equations to translate between rotational and translational motion, we were able to get one simple governing equation of the system. From here, the Laplace transform was done to, per, to determine the transfer function. We have two transfer functions listed, one that goes from the servo angle to position and one that goes from beam angle to the position. This is the block diagram showing the overall layout for our system for the ball and beam. A more detailed version will be shown on the next slide. Take the Simulink, first a repeating sequence stair block was used to simulate our desired positions for where the ball would need to land during each segment of the test section. The group's ball started at 2 inches and then landed at 7 inches, 10 inches, and 4 inches on the beam. Next, a sum block was used to sum together the output of the repeating stair sequence block and the feedback loop taken from after the PID mechanical advantage transfer function and disturbance were accounted for. After that, the group used a PID controller block to add in the values of KI, KP, and KD. A transfer function block was then used to represent the group's mechanical advantage. Then another transfer function block was used to actually add in the transfer function of our beam. Next, at this second sum block, the group added in a disturbance to account for the friction, air resistance, beam instability, and signal interference. This was done using a random number block that represents the actual position of the ball on the beam. This block does not actually function or affect data output in any way. It is just there to show a complete model. Finally, the dual port scope was used to output the desired position of the ball and the actual position of the ball onto a graph. This is the graph that the scope and Simulink outputs. This graph was created to display with an X axis representing time and a Y axis representing the ball position. The blue line in this graph represents the desired position of the ball and the yellow line represents the actual position of the ball. Here's our test result sheet. Our final K values were five for KP, 1.3 for KI and three for KD. For when, when we tested the points 7, 10, and 4, for all our disturbances and all of our change in positions, the ball never hit our TPU, TPU stops. In order for our ball and beam to work, we designed a code that used the PID library that was taken from Arduino. In this code, we were able to set our KI, KP, and KD values. And as you can see in line 20, we are calling the PID object which has ball position, set point, KP, KI, and KD as the inputs, and the output is input angle. 
In order for our Arduino code to read the hard and soft potentiometer, we had to map them according to our desired uh, values. As you can see in line 36, we are mapping the hard potentiometer from 0 inches to 12 inches. And in line 42, we are mapping the soft potentiometer based on the values that we have set. We want a constraint between 0 and 13.25 inches. In line 45, we have mypid.compute, which takes in the other values talked about before, and it spits out input angle. Once the PID library is computed, we're going to get an input angle. And as can be seen in line 47, we want to write to servo output to equal 46 minus input angle. This is because we want to make sure that our beam is always staying horizontal and that it always goes back to our horizontal position, which we found to be 46 degrees. And the servo.write function takes the servo output and it maps it to the servo so it moves accordingly to the angle that we desire. Taking a look at our system performance for each of the three tests, we can see that the ball moved to the desired position, plus or minus a quarter inch in the allotted time. The ball was able to do this because the servo was able to make micro adjustments, and the KP, KI, and KD values made it so that it had smooth and continuous movement. Taking a look at some of the problems that we had with this, we could see that three main problems were the hard and soft potentiometer were interfering with each other. A solution to this was we made sure that the pot value raw and sensor value raw were read twice. This is because we could actually get the correct value and not the interference value. The second issue is that the server motor would not oscillate fast enough. And to remedy this, we increased KI so we could have the servo react to faster changes. And the third issue is that the soft potentiometer would not read correctly. And we had to raise it in order to put it on an angle so we could read the correct values. Now we will look at a bit of our test from 7 inches to 10 inches. As you can see, we changed the dial over to 10, and it's going to start slowly zeroing in on the correct value. And as you can see, that took about 15 seconds, so now we're going to let it sit for 10 seconds. And then at the end of the 10 seconds, we displace it and it very quickly comes back to 10 inches in about 5 seconds. And then we will continue to let it sit for another 10 inches. 10 seconds. Thank you very much for watching our ball and beam video. If you have any questions, feel free to email us at any of the email addresses below.